name is Andrew Malik. I'm a senior UI developer and designer. I'm on Twitter at Malik on the web, M-A-L-E-K on the web, where I talk about user experience, design, sometimes a little bit about blues, photography, and other things. This talk is about cognitive biases and the user experience. Now there's a mouthful. Now, imagine a long, long time ago, but not in a galaxy far, far away, but here on Earth. Early humans are in a hunting group searching for big game. And all of a sudden, the rustling of leaves was heard. Seconds later, bam, an animal attack, causing the death of one of his members. Now, if during a later hunt, the sound of rustling leaves was heard again, those who remembered what happened next and reacted by being ready to fight or flee probably had a greater chance of survival than those that didn't make that connection. Of course, rustling of leaves doesn't always mean a huge animal is ready to strike. The rustling could have been due to harmless birds. Now this connection of the leaves to potential danger leads to the subject of cognitive biases. What is a cognitive bias? It's a systematic error in thinking that occurs when people are processing and interpreting information in the world around them. It affects the decisions and judgments that they make. The human brain is powerful but it's subject to limitations. These biases are often a result of your brain's attempt to simplify information processing. Biases often work as rules of thumb that help you make sense of the world and reach decisions with relative speed. Now, there are theoretical reasons behind cognitive biases with some presumably a result of adaptation. Processing a large amount of information quickly, shown in the previous example, can be the difference between life and death. Recognizing patterns had, and still has, a purpose. So to simplify the complicated world around us, our brains can, if provided a long series of information, just focus on the first or last pieces, so instead of having to read the entire series. It can help us rationalize the decisions that we make, including shutting out conflicting information. It makes us feel better, and thus more willing to make decisions in the future. And it also helps us see patterns wherein they really don't exist at all to give us some attempt to make sense of random data. Now, this talk will delve into a few of these biases, how they affect our everyday thinking and how they affect our thinking in the world of user experience. One of the most important UX tenets is based on handling the false consensus effect. Coined in 1977 by psychologists Ross, Green, and House, the false consensus effect is the phenomenon and tendency to overestimate the degree to which other people will agree with you, think like you, and behave like you. Because think about it. During your lifetime, what person do you think you spend the most time with? Why? Yourself, of course. Now, here's an example of the false consensus effect in real life. You might have heard a crazy celebrity story on the news or TMZ. You wondered how a celebrity could have acted a certain way. Why, if I was in their shoes, I wouldn't have done such and such. But you don't know the stresses that people deal with, the constant pressure to look or act a certain way, their upbringing, their beliefs. You can't assume they would or should act the way you would have. And perhaps you wouldn't have acted the same way. Also, Maybe you're enjoying some chocolate ice cream. You assume it must be everybody's favorite. Everybody loves chocolate, right? Well, according to a study by the International Dairy Foods Association, the favorite in the US is actually vanilla. It's not necessarily what you think. Now, you are not the user. One of the most important things to think about in user experience. According to Ruluka Boudou, the director of research at Nielsen Norman Group, it become one of the mantras of user experience and rightly so. All our work as UX professionals stems from the assumption that we are different from our users. Artifacts that are right for us aren't necessarily right for our users. We cannot judge user interface quality based on whether we like a design ourselves. We need to learn how to create systems that are right for those who will actually use them. UX design is not about you. It's about how what you create benefits others and how it's understandable and easy to use by others. But unfortunately, we assume a lot 
about who actually will be using our creations because of the tendency to base designs off our own life experiences. Now, almost anything you assume about the end user must be tested. What are their demographics? What are their hopes, their fears? What are their disabilities? Accessibility should always be a concern in design, but some ignore or push this aside due to timing or cost or whatever, but laws and recent interpretation of laws are changing this. Now, what are the user's opinions of related or competing products or services to what you're offering? Age, gender, educational level, marital status, income level, all of these can and will be different than you. Catering to a limited subset of backgrounds will limit your application or services reach. Now, according to Hunter Jensen, CEO of Barefoot Solutions, you must perform UX testing and research with actual users where you've got to identify assumptions you make, but think about what the answers to those assumptions are and write questions to challenge them in doing your testing. And always ensure your participants come from a variety of backgrounds. Now, related to the false consensus effect, one of the assumptions many professionals have is the curse of knowledge. Now, this occurs when an individual communicating with other individuals unknowingly assumes that the others have the background to understand. Now, some examples of this. We assume users will know what a particular icon represents. Perhaps this may be the hamburger menu. Now, some will, or a lot of people, will instantly get that those three lines mean menu. But not everyone will understand that. And not everyone even understands the VCR style buttons that are seen in media players. Also, it's easy for us to assume others will understand complex microcopy, acronyms we use without providing any explanations. But are these understood by everyone in the industry? Is your choice of words understandable by everyone who's a target user of your app, your website or service? People of all education levels and knowledge of the particular language. Perhaps simplification is needed. So how can we help avoid this? To, again, test your application or service with a variety of people with different backgrounds, educational experience, and not just coworkers. Never ask when doing testing if people are confused, but watch what they do. People very well may not admit that they're confused, but it can be detected. Perhaps it's a longer amount of time to take a, to perform a particular action, Maybe they're constantly in doing. Maybe they never perform an action that you ask them to do during testing. And remember, if one person's confused, assume others may be, and factor that into your design. Next bias we're going to discuss is the confirmation bias. And according to Encyclopedia Britannica, that's the tendency to process information by looking for or interpreting information that is consistent with one's existing beliefs. This biased approach to decision-making is largely unintentional. It often results in ignoring inconsistent information. Now, real life examples straight from the current news, following Facebook feeds agreeable to one's own personal beliefs and ideals, and then mostly seeing posts agreeing to your views. If you just see the same posts from the same people, you'll have no idea what the other side is thinking or what their views are or how you can help or how you can correspond with them. Also, maybe you're looking to go to a particular restaurant, remember this, let's say pre-COVID days, or maybe you're looking to purchase a particular product and you already have an opinion of the product, so you're already looking at positive or negative reviews on Yelp or Amazon or eBay. And by doing that, you ignore countering opinions to your own. So you pretty much prove that the product or service is good or bad based off your own opinions and not looking at all the reviews. How can this affect uh, user experience? Well, imagine doing A-B testing. And this is where you test if one design, the A, can be improved with a change, the B. Perhaps you're designing a form, and there's a big blue continue button on the bottom. But someone suggests changing that button to green to make it easier for people to see. Now, you disagree with that change, but you make it anyway, and you test the change with 10 users. In doing so, you find that fewer users actually find the button. Boom, you are correct. The blue button wins. But there may be some problems in that line of thought. Perhaps 10 people aren't enough to test with. And maybe your choice of green wasn't correct. Maybe green does work, but the contrast wasn't enough. 
but you never know if you just stuck to your original opinion and found that your test confirmed your hypothesis. Now, user feedback can fuel confirmation bias. Many of you are familiar with a net promoter score. This is a 10 point system where you customer experience and feedback is requested. Users answer questions responding with a one to 10 or zero to 10 from not at all likely or extremely negative to highly likely or extremely positive. So let's assume that you make a change to a design. You think people are going to like it. So to test this change, you either ask people in a room how satisfied they are with the design, or maybe you have a pop-up feedback form so a few people can try out the changes and then provide you feedback from a zero to 10 or one to 10 scale. Now, you do this and all nine or 10 scores confirm your decision, the change was great, let's ship the product. Uh, but did people actually notice your change? Maybe they liked the rest of the design, but not that particular change. What if another change would result in even better user experience? You might never know. Not only this, but depending on who you are asking, and if they're all in the same room, some people may just want to be polite and give nine or 10 scores. They don't want to be rude. What if another change accidentally slipped into the test and affected the results, but your design change is confirmed by your users? In that case, your results may suffer from the illusory correlation. This is a phenomenon of perceiving a relationship between variables, typically people, events, or behaviors, that exists even when no such relationship exists. Again, correlation, not causation. And now, no, this isn't an advertisement for the Swedish furniture company IKEA. So if you want, we can call the IKEA effect, the Lego effect, the idea is the same. This is according to a research paper in the Journal of Consumer Psychology by Michael Norton, Daniel Mokon, and Dan Airely. And it states that the IKEA effect is when people imbue products with their own labor, when they do that, their effort can actually increase the product's valuation. So what do I mean by that? Here are some real life examples. Build-A-Bear workshop. In this case, the child actually decides part of how they want the bear to look. So the thought is the finished product is going to be enjoyed more and played more by the kid because they had an opinion into the product. The same as with Lego or Mindstorm. And in this case, it may be kids or adults. The more you play with a particular toy, the more you build, the longer you're going to experience the product and the better you're going to feel about the end result. So you'll probably end up buying more and more blocks. Restaurants such as Subway, Chipotle, Blaze Pizza, you don't just order an item off the menu, but you actually help create the item you're about to consume. So you're gonna feel better about the result. And I mentioned before, social networking sites such as Facebook or Twitter, you spend time working on an avatar, customizing your profile, deciding who you're going to follow or friend. And by doing that, you feel better about the actual network and you're gonna probably spend more time on the network because you've imbued your own time into the product. Now, according to UX designer Anton Nikoloff, simple actions requiring low effort and making the user feel like having a high contribution will actually lower the fear of dealing with a new product. And if this is done properly and continuously for a period of time, it even can lead to a loyalty to the brand and product. Now, this action must be simple, but have a distinct result. And that's why if you're designing a website or app that requires users to sign into the service, Getting them to do something after sign-in is critical. Offer the user ways to review products or services. Let them have the ability to customize their interface a little. Maybe that's even light or dark mode. Tailor their experience based on their interests. Add details to their profile. Some may not want to customize, but others may actually become brand ambassadors if they feel they have some control over the product or service. Now, according to a blog entry from Developer Hub SitePoint, the IKEA effect can have a negative result for designers. Because the longer we spend and more work we put into a design, the harder it is for us to find issues. Because it may seem a natural thing to be attached to a project that you were part of, especially if you were there from the beginning. This is my baby. I don't want anyone criticizing it. So what are workarounds? If you're working on a design, put it aside, return to it a few days later with a fresh set of eyes. 
and uh, again, request honest, constructive criticism from others and listen to it. Now, confirmation bias leads well into the framing bias, also called the framing effect. And this occurs when people decide on options based on if the options are presented with a positive, negative semantics, such as a loss or as a gain. And an example, again from the news, all of the political surveys, do you think we can risk electing insert politician due to their opinion on insert issue? Now, that question doesn't ask whether you agree with a politician or their stance is an issue, but it immediately stokes fear into you because of the word risk. You may not know the real opinion of the politician on a particular issue, and you may even agree with them, but that frame question makes you immediately think in the negative. Now imagine a search box appears as such. Now it's not accessed a lot, so you think it needs a redesign. So you happen to come up with this, for example. So you test it with a group of users and you ask them, how did the new search box make it easier for you to search? Well, that's definitely a leading or framing question because now you're making people think, well, the new search box must be easier to search because that's how they asked the question. But that's framing, that's leading them into thinking a certain way. Maybe you should ask, did the new search box make it easier for you? Or better yet, which search box was easier to use? Or even better, just watch users and see which ones use which search box, how long it takes. By watching them and not asking any questions, you get a better result, a more accurate result. Now, imagine as a UX researcher, you're reporting results of your work. How you actually report the results can greatly affect how the report will be received by others what decisions are made from your research. So imagine you made the changes before, you had 30 people, you have results, and you showed it to uh, your manager or team. You can say in your results that four participants never tried the new search box, or you can say 26 participants tried the new search box. So how your results are reported can actually affect what decisions are made by UX management. Now to discuss the halo effect. And this is from digital marketing company CXL. The halo effect is a cognitive bias where one trait of someone or something actually influences how you feel about other completely unrelated traits. So here's an example. What would you think going into a store about the entire store if the first thing you saw was this shoe section? You would probably think the entire store is unkempt. The workers don't care. Customers don't clean after themselves. You're gonna probably have a negative, basically feeling of the entire store based off this first section you visit. But if you see this, what would you think? Well, store is organized. Employees work to keep the store clean. You might also think the store is a little pricier. That first section affects how you think about the entire store. Now, according to UX expert Don Norman, okay, I've just biased Don Norman by calling him an expert. Now, he's a principal of UX consulting firm Nielsen Norman Group. He's a UX book author. He served at faculty at multiple universities, so I think it's okay we can call him an expert. According to him, positive effect makes people more tolerant of minor difficulties, more flexible and creative in finding solutions to their problems. Products designed for more relaxed, pleasant occasions can actually enhance their usability through pleasant aesthetic design. Aesthetics matter. Attractive things work better. Now, halo effect can influence the testing process. Perhaps you're doing testing and you have an established brand. That could cause problems because people may volunteer for a test and they already have a high opinion of your brand and they'll probably provide much more positive results to all of your questions. Or the opposite can be true, and maybe they don't like your brand at all, and no matter what you offer as far as changes, they're gonna respond in a negative. Now you've completely biased the user research. So what can you do? Maybe it's possible to test the pages or app or a service without any brand identification whatsoever. When recruiting people, try not to mention the name of the brand. But if you have to show the brand, 
then make sure people understand and keep reinforcing the fact that feedback is important and ensure them all feedback and observations will be considered. When it comes to design, first impressions do matter. A difficult to use or non-delightful first page screen can deter people away from an app. Now, through research, try to find out what actions users are most likely to perform first and focus on improving that experience. Often that's a sign-in or sign-up procedure. And when getting people into an app or service, too many questions can drive people away. They may never come back. That's why you often see guests check out in e-commerce sites so people can go ahead and purchase a product without having to go through the whole process of creating an account. Performance matters. Slow responses will drive people away. And you have to have consistency. Just because there is this bias, you still need to make sure an entire app or service performs similarly. Have style guides and enforce those style guides so the entire app, or website, or service performs in the same way. Now, what does a storage location for bikes have to do with cognitive biases? Well, we're going to talk about the Parkinson's Law of Triviality, or otherwise called the Bike Shed Effect. And this is named for Cyril Northcote Parkinson, a British naval historian and author. And this represents the tendency to give disproportionate weight to trivial issues, avoid specialized or complex subjects. If you talk about building a large complex, it may be overwhelming to discuss all the intricacies of the complex, but people can focus on one small part of the complex, which might just be a particular bike shed. And what color do you want to paint that bike shed? Hence the name of this bias. Some real life examples, maybe you're building a house. You're focusing on the window treatment, but you get the most expensive windows at the cost of everything else. Now you run over budget. As a developer, you may spend hours upon hours optimizing a rarely used function and don't focus on the entire application or what's important. Same can occur as a designer. You may focus too much time on one screen while ignoring the overall look and feel of the application or service. Now, the law of triviality can affect any designer working by themselves, but it especially comes to play when working with others, such as offering a design for review. It's very easy for people to focus on one tiny detail, such as link color. Not that link color isn't important for consistency and accessibility, but by doing that, they may ignore the architecture of a complex website or service. Now, some things you can do in a design review meeting to help address this bias. Make sure to set an agenda of larger topics that have to be discussed before the meeting or the review. Ensure that the decision maker is present because if the person who can make decisions isn't available, why run the meeting? Now show some patience because if they are talking about intricacies of the design, at least it means they're paying attention and discussion is better than silence. Time box your discussions. So you need to limit your discussions so that you can work on the big picture. And if you have to, jokingly mention that bike shedding is occurring. Everybody will get a good laugh, ha ha ha, and hopefully that'll encourage everybody to move on to the next topic. You can go back into the details later, but you need to look at the entire application architecture as a whole to make sure that is correct. Now, a couple of links to talk about the law of triviality is from Daniel Burka, a designer's guide to the Parkinson's law of triviality, and from Pierce Scott, some design stakeholders are more important than others. Now, sometimes the law of triviality leads to, or excuse me, occurs as a result of the action bias. Now, one definition of this is by self-improvement author of Be, Think, Do, Mike Stern, Mike Strum. The action bias is the tendency to think that value can only be realized through action. It's a tendency to act as opposed to practicing restraint. Perhaps both are actually reasonable options. Real life example, let's take the sport of soccer, which the rest of the world calls football, where a soccer goalie is awaiting a penalty kick. Now, in this situation, it's just the goalie versus the kicker and potentially 100,000 people in the stands and millions of people watching the game on TV. Okay, there's a little pressure involved. 
Now, in this situation, an Israeli study was done of over 200 kicks. This was cited in the American Council of Science and Health, which showed that statistically, it was actually better for the goalie not to jump. They would actually stop more kicks than to jump in one direction. But goalies often move because they think it would seem foolish if a penalty kick occurred and they didn't jump to one direction. They feel like they have to act. And also, this could encourage stakeholders to recommend a design change during a review just to prove their worth. If they don't recommend a change, why are they there? It could encourage designers to change an existing design that's already been done without proper testing, again, just to prove their worth. And as, you know, there are good points to action bias. We're talking about design thinking sessions. Thinking too much might actually not be recommended. You need ideas quickly and you need lots of them. And later you can determine which ideas to research and which to ignore. Now let's combine these two biases. Ever present a design to a product owner and they felt like, and you felt like they changed everything. No matter what design you proposed, a change was made. Now this is sometimes called Atwood's duck. It goes like this. According to lore, the game Battle Chess which some of you may remember was just like chess on the computer screen, but when a queen took a pawn or a rook took a bishop, there was a little animation to show the one piece taking another. Artists was working on animations and always got their animations criticized, they nitpick little things. So they decided when coming up with the queen animation, they were gonna do something different. They added a duck to the animation. For no reason, just to do so. When they showed the queen animation to the producer, everything went as expected. But at the end, they got one comment back from the producer. That looks great. Just one thing. Get rid of the duck. Problem is solved. All the queen animations went in as the designer wanted, and the producer got to make a change in action, even though it was trivial. Now, another bias that can affect everyone is the bandwagon effect. And this is a psychological phenomenon in which people do something primarily because other people are doing it, regardless of their own beliefs, which they might ignore or override. Multiple stocks dropping or rising might actually cause others to buy or sell stocks without performing their own research. Maybe developers are ignoring answers on Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange that have very few upvotes. They blindly copy and paste the highest rated answers, even though the highest rated answers may not be apropos to their situation. When it comes to user experience, providing testimonial sections when offering a product or service, they can have a very positive economic impact. Showing a photo of a person providing a testimonial can make it even more powerful and trustworthy. Testimonials can be in the form of reviews, case studies, or stories. Now, when presenting designs, one person's excitement about a potential feature or design might actually cause others to get excited without doing their own due diligence. So this can be an issue. Someone with a very highly outgoing personality becomes a cheerleader for a feature or design. And that can be contagious. Developers or designers who might be a little more introverted might have some issues with that change, but they may not be able to offset the enthusiasm of the bandwagon effect. Now, when performing research in a group, one person's opinion one person who stands out from a group as a leader or someone who's more extroverted, they can actually cause everyone else to instinctively agree with them. Or if you're telling participants that a task is simple or hard, it actually can make it seem easier or harder for the participants to perform that task. So again, be very careful. In that sense, you're framing the statement. Now, two blogs on UX Collective go into this and other biases in more detail. The types of cognitive biases you need to be aware of as a researcher by Cho Chung Ching and cognitive biases in user research by Abdu Garini. So for good or ill, cognitive biases are attempts to process input. Over a hundred of these exist, including those involving decision-making, memory, and rationalizing our behavior. These biases can affect UX design, the research process, testing, and presenting the research. So to help mitigate the effect, challenge all assumptions. Consider not using large focus groups, but testing with one participant at a time. Facilitate meetings effectively so they don't regress into triviality. 
Watch out for leading or framing questions. Now, double check that your results actually have causes and they're not just correlations. Remember that unless you're literally designing for yourself or others like you, you are not the user. The more you understand who users really are, what are their goals? What are their backgrounds? The more you understand all this, the better you can design products and services that will benefit others. Again, I'm on Twitter at Malik on the web, M-A-L-E-K on the web. Thank you all very much for coming. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your conference.